Welcome to Traveling Down, Biblical Archaeology for the 21st Century. Hi, I'm Gary Byers. This is Dr. Steve Collins. And we're talking today from the ARC, the Archaeological Research Center of the Tal El Hammam Excavation Project. We dig at Tal El Hammam in Jordan. And uh, this is what archaeology is like in the 21st century. Dr. C, we got this vessel here, but what's wrong with this vessel? Well, there's a lot of things wrong with it. First of all, it's, it's not all there. You I, can see. Yeah, here, I'll turn it around so you really get a picture of that. Yeah, so um, we have bits and pieces of it. Uh, and again, if you, if you look at the, the previous episode that we did, um, with another vessel, uh, a vessel that was blown apart, scorched, the various parts of it were scorched completely differently or not scorched at all. Yeah and spread over 20 meters moving southwest and northeast. This vessel is found in the same kind of context. It actually comes from the palace as well. But you can see we don't have all of it. We collected these pieces over m many meters strewn uh, on the floor or more or less on the floor. And some of the bigger pieces, especially some of these painted pieces like these, smashing up against a southwest facing wall right next to a very large grinding stone. We call it a saddle kern because it's big enough to sit on. <laughs> and, um, but you can see that this is a fine, we call this a fine wear vessel. Now it starts out, interestingly, let's look at the bottom. It starts out. So this isn't the top? No, this is the bottom. And these look like handles, but they're, we call them loop handle bases. How many would there be on this There'd one? There'd be three. There'd be one here, one here, yeah, and you one see here. That broken area there. So it's yeah. a triple loop base. And, but you can see this, this uh, multiple slips of different colors. There's, a, there's sort of an orangey slip and a, and a very white creamy slip and a tan colored slip that are being slopped on over the entirety of the vessel. But then something else happened. Then they burnished it. Which means to polish it up with a bone or a stone. Polish it up with a smooth bone or stone. And then they painted it. That's beautiful painting. You can see it's a beautiful, beautiful decorate, job of decorating. And again, the typical Middle Bronze Age too. We're talking about this vessel. The destruction of the city happened around 1700 BC, and the destruction, um, of course, that blew it apart also discolored it. So it looks like, again, we have lots of different kinds of scorches and scorch marks going on. But the decoration is beautiful. It's just wiggly, wiggly horizontal lines that are very typical of the Middle Bronze yeah. Age. But I want, you, I want to show you the various scorching. Remember, this vessel was not found all in the same day, all in the same place. It was found essentially in the same locus, but that locus is a very large one. It goes the whole width of a square. This was found strewn over six meters from one end of that square to the other. And you can see that here, this particular piece was scorched differently than the piece we added to it. Okay. And this piece was scorched differently than that piece. And if you look in the inside, it's pretty dramatic. Can you get on the inside and see this dramatic scorching? Can you see that? Yeah, he's getting it. Right here. This piece is scorched. This piece is scorched differently. This part of it's not scorched at all, but it has its own different scorch pattern up here. Here's another one. Look at this one. If we can get right, peek right through, yep. here's a scorch pattern on this particular shirt that's different from the one next to it. It's discolored differently. And you can see this on the outside. Here's scorching. Here is scorching. But you can see that this piece... It's connected to this piece. These are two different pieces, but you can see the scorch going on to both of them. But this piece that attaches to this piece, this piece is untouched. 
It's very interesting how all this happens. Well, what's happening is that, that the force of the blast from southwest to northeast that destroyed the city, this meteoritic airburst that blasted 400 square kilometers, including the entirety of Tal Hammam, was very, very powerful so that virtually nothing survives intact. And Gary, we've been excavating on that site for 15 seasons, and we find in the Middle Bronze Age destruction layer, we rarely find intact vessels. And if we do find an intact vessel, it's on the, uh, it's on the northeast side of a wall yeah. being protected by the wall stub that didn't get sheared off. And so we do find some, but most of the vessels, and you can see all of the vessels on these trays are bits and pieces, but they are all one or two or three pieces, and the rest of the vessel is nowhere to be found. Now, we, we still got more to dig there, and there, there may be, we may find those pieces, and of course, unless they were painted, we wouldn't recognize them, but because they are. So let's look at some of your other cool stuff that you have there. Yeah. Now, here's, this is kind of a, a big brother or a little brother, I'm not sure yeah, which, because we don't have the rest of it. similar. Very similar to this decoration. A little bit different coloration, but um, all of these were found with mixed with this. Yes. But this is all we found of this one. <laughs> okay, we didn't find the rest of it. Thankfully, a lot of that was banked up against a southwest-facing yeah. wall, kind yeah. of banked up with a bunch of grain and a bunch of burned material. But... Um, uh, that's a piece of fine ware. We have another piece, and this, this sort of goes to the, to the top of the game, Gary. Uh, actually, we do have the rim. That Just is, a that is the actual rim, yeah. but can you see that the, that the thickness of that pottery? Now, this is a little, you know, little stirrer stick like you get at a coffee shop, right? Well, how thin is that? That's about a millimeter. Yeah. It's not much thinner than that. Uh, uh, thicker than that. Compare it. If you compare the thickness of this pottery to the thickness of this stir stick, yeah, that's amazing. The pottery is just barely, barely thicker than that. This is what we call eggshell thin yeah. pottery, and it's beautiful. It's chocolate on white. Once again, it's got the white slip. It's got the typical Middle Bronze Age II wiggly horizontal decoration and, and lines. And uh, so this is a really, really fine vessel. This is, this is way up there in the, uh, in the quality level of, uh, art, of art and artisans of the yeah. ancient world. Yeah. The, uh, the, the fast wheel was, was created and, and started to be used uh, around the ancient Near East. Uh, maybe 22,000, 2100 BC. And so this is a product of that kind of uh, uh, creation of vessels. And this is amazing. They couldn't do things like this before they had a fast wheel. And boy, once they got it going, did they ever get it going? Yeah, this and they, went a, little, they went a little crazy. We can see <laughs> that some of the vessels are so thin that when yes. they fired them, yeah. they kind of drooped. Yeah. And, so, and so the potters probably looked at that and went, well, I guess we need to back off a little bit. Yeah, and won't not, do that and, one again. And not try to be so thin with it. Uh, there's, this is another one. Now, these are all, this is called a crater. You'd call this one a crater. This is called a carinated bowl. And this one would be called a carinated bowl as well. But this one has a little special feature. I wish we had the rest of it, but we don't. There's a little applique on here. Uh, of a snake. Yeah, we, whenever you see that kind of thing, we, we call it a snake. Maybe that's not what they meant it to be, but that's what we But we know to from as. other vessels uh, found at other sites that this snake would have gone around, up the handle, and looking over into the bowl. Yeah, okay. very well done. So, but you'll notice that it's decorated on the outside and it's decorated and burnished and decorated on the inside. So that's a special vessel. And that, of course, that means the vessel, we call that an open vessel, where you could look inside of it. So when you have an open vessel, you're going to decorate, make the inside nice. And when the, it's not an open vessel, you don't really care that much. In fact, there was one storage jar that we found the base of, not, not a whole thing, but just the base of it. 
and the potter had evidently been rolling up, making a little coil of clay, <laughs> dropped it down in there, and it was a storage jar. And so he apparently said, probably his assistant, probably said, nobody will ever see it, nobody will ever know, just left it in there, and 3,000 years later, 4,000 years later, we find it, and we just had a hoot because he thought he got away with it, yeah. but not with us. It was going to be a handle, but <laughs> oops. And then um, here's some more, Gary. This is, I mean, we're kind of giving a lesson on chocolate on white here, aren't we? Yeah, but that um, was such a special uh, design yeah. in, in that time. In Again, the here's the age. white. Yeah. But this is this is all we found of the, the, this vessel. All of the stuff you're seeing here, these were all just single pieces strewn into the matrix with these others, which thankfully we have a little bit more of. But again, here's the, you know, and I suppose if someone got creative, they could say, well, this is dark chocolate, this is milk chocolate. <laughs> but this is chocolate, again, chocolate on white ware. Now, this is an interesting one because this is more or less in the chocolate on white ware tradition, but it's bichrome. Yeah, two this, color. This is red and, and black. And the red and black decoration is an influence from the Sea Peoples or from the Aegean, Aegean world. world. And so we've got um, probably some visitors or some trade happening. It's probably a, a vessel made locally. The clay looks very local. But um, uh, so we have influences from all over the world because people are coming to, to the site. Here's another one of our... Now this looks remarkably like this vessel. Okay. It isn't this vessel, it's completely different paint, but you can see uh, it's not as scorched, so wherever it landed was more protected, but you can see again the chocolate on white decoration. Don't know about its fellows, but this is all we've got of this yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. Here's another one. This is, almost, this is almost a reddish decoration, Gary. Yeah. And it's very possible that these two pieces come from the same vessel, the, the, the white slip goes right down on the, that's the top of it, but it's very po possible that these two pieces go together, but we can't, um, we can't say that. They both, no. oh, this comes from UA, 6GG, and 6HH. We'll have to look at those and see from the, from the clay body itself if those could possibly connect. There's a lot of it. Now, some of these have handles. Let's talk about this handle. This is a very popular handle style for the Middle Bronze Age. You can see it has two ropes stuck together. Yeah, we call those those little coils, each one, we call each one a rope. So it's a double rope handle that they used to do a lot in the Middle Bronze Age. Yeah, and this is a typ of typical of j small juglets. Yeah. yeah. And it isn't unusual. Now, not all their handles are double rope. Some are single, but a lot of them are double. Some are even triple, triple. or quads. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a very common kind of a thing to and do. And usually not painted, but that one, that one was. And this vessel was absolutely gorgeous. It is polished really well, shines very well, but look at the very delicate decoration. And even though it's not as thin as this one, it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty yeah. finely done. Yep. And so the chocolate on whiteware tradition is all over the place in the palace. Yeah. They seem to really love it. And they produce lots of, here's even more of it. And we have some more over here and more over there. But there's lots of different variations on the same theme. White slip with brown, brownish, reddish brown decoration. And that really does come from a, an Aegean uh, background because their clay was white. And then they would they wouldn't have to put a slip of, of clay right. to give it a different color. So this is this is the inside of the vessel. This is what the clay looked like. But then they put this white slip, and slip is a a, a real thin layer of clay, real thin bit of clay in water, and they literally would paint it on. So this is a white slip to to be like the Aegean. Our Italian film director says, "Tone it around, show them again." And so, so here's, this is a white slip and then this chocolatey, uh, reddish, brownish uh, clay. Sometimes it gets rather quite dark, sometimes a little bit reddish, but this is, this is really, that's just gorgeous.
it's just absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful stuff. And what's interesting about this is that these are the kinds of vessels that would go into the actual the living rooms of the palace. Yeah. These are all found to the northeast of the living quarters of the palace in the kitchen. Yeah. Why would you have vessels like this that are display vessels in the kitchen mingled with the sherds of cooking pots and storage jars and all manner of vessels that are used in the preparation of food, but these vessels are strewn in. And the, and the probability that these were pushed over from the palace mm -hmm. complex, from, from the actual living quarters and dining quarters and, and even maybe a throne room of the, of the palace, were pushed in the destructive event from the southwest to the northeast. And some of this material is landing in the matrix that actually bl think. blows yeah. over the northeast into the palace area. So we got about two minutes. So say, um, just say a word about our, our next venture into the palace where we, we've, we didn't know it, but we've found the kitchen area. But talk about, just to get two minutes, talk about the palace itself, what we got, what we got to do to get well, there. Well, the big problem is, Gary, that, that about 700 years after the destruction of the Middle Bronze Age, of course, during that 700 years, nobody lived there. And there is a large uh -huh. warehouse built in the Iron Age around 1000 B.C., built there, and it takes up a lot of space. It's built pretty much over the living quarters of the palace. And then on top of that is a Roman, Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine um, lookout tower, signal tower, maybe even turned into a Byzantine shrine of some sort yeah, yeah. Um, later. But here are these layers of occupation or of architecture going over the top of the palace. That makes an archaeologist stay up late at night or even not sleep at all, trying to figure out how in the world are we going to get into the main part of the Middle Bronze Age palace without disturbing that other material. We're still working on it. I think we have a solution that we can tear us in from the side and, and there, there are some sections of those buildings that are destroyed anyway because there was military damage on the site. So the military damage has destroyed some of it. That we can remove and then we can move into the palace proper. Um, in 2020, I excavated a really deep trench, way, way deep on the far southwest edge. And we, we found the outer wall of the palace. And, and we estimate that it was the size of the White House yeah, in just, Washington, D.C. Yeah, the footprint itself is just about the size, a little bit larger than, than the footprint of the White House. And um, we don't know how many stories it is, but based on the size of our walls, typically some of the interior walls are, are 80 centimeters to a meter thick. That's easily supporting two stories, maybe three. These exterior walls are better than three meters, and they could go up quite, quite high. Yeah. So we got lots more to find. They just gave us tantalizing pieces in the kitchen. Can't wait to get into the good stuff. Well, this is archaeology, biblical archaeology for the 21st century. Welcome to Troweling Down. Hope you'll join us again soon.